When we put together this brief survey of worship leaders with the help of a leading sociologist with the hope that if we could ascertain both what the long-term trends are in the industry and how the local worship leader feels about them, it would be helpful for everybody. My belief is that we are in a season where trust in the church is at an all-time low. More than ever, we need to be transparent, honest, and operate with integrity. If we're a Christian mechanic, we probably don't need to put Christian in front of mechanic. And so I think the same is true in the ways that we talk about business and the infrastructure of business and logistics around it. If we can't talk about it on business terms, why are we hiding? Your local church and you might be the only place many people hear and discover new Christian songs. But it was primarily a for-profit business interest that drove the spread of hymnals. So as Jake said, I'm Elias Dummer. I'm Canadian, songwriter, worship leader, massive nerd, I'm an entrepreneur, I run a marketing agency for 16 years, some household name clients, a lot of strategy stuff. And I spent the last 10 years before moving back to Hamilton, I spent the last 10 years in Nashville. I was the front man in a worship band called the City Harmonic, which retired in 2017, mostly due to illness, if you remember in our band, and I've continued to release music under my own name ever since, much of that worship music. Um, it's also the case that for the entire 18 years I've worked in the music industry as an artist and writer, I've run this strategic consulting agency. So today I have a handful of companies that do different things, but understanding how things tick. The thing behind the thing has always been an important part of how I make a living. Quite a few years back now, I befriended a pastor by the name of Mike Tapper, who would go on to become an academic research and professor. We had hit it off, and he knew what he, I was doing behind the scenes, so I would occasionally come in and guest lecture at his school from time to time, where he was kind of head of a worship department. Well, he had just finished and released some important research about worship music, and we were musing about the fact that so much of the machinery which profoundly shapes the worship music of the local church today is a mystery to the people doing it. And so my friend Mike assembled a group of academics and we started something which came to be known as Worship Leader Research to help explore the state of the industry and the ways that industry specifically interfaces and engages with the local church. We're like a, a team of nerdy Avengers you don't want in a fight who might not be saving the world, but we're sure going to tell the truth about it in the hopes that somebody can. <laughs> and that it helps what all of us do together do exactly that in Christ. Now, we launched our project with an exploration of 10 years of CCLI and praise charts data. I'm just going to give you a bit of a snapshot of our team. Dr. Shannon Baker, myself, Mark Jolliker, Dr. Adam Perez, and Dr. Mike Tapper. Um, I know Mark and I talk often about why we are there around a bunch of doctors, but we are grateful to be. Um, when we put together this brief survey of worship leaders with the help of a leading sociologist with the hope that if we could ascertain both what the long-term trends are in the industry and how the local worship leader feels about them, it would be helpful for everybody. Well, today I've been asked to come and share a little about the research and the machinery that it describes and some of, the, what some of the potential considerations might be. Um, I've been asked to do this in 35 minutes. So I will tell you, uh, it's going to be a bit of a speedy race this morning. But in short, for the next few minutes, we'll be pulling the curtain back on Oz. Now, before I do, I'd like to be very clear about a few things. We are all worship leaders ourselves on this team. We're all engaged in different ways. We have been for many years I'm 40, I started leading worship when I was 12 at a church with slim pickings. <laughs> I've been at it a minute. We aren't working from a place which seeks to tear anything down. We are not looking at them and seeing how they are different from us. We are looking at us and saying, how is what we are doing together not doing the thing we think it's doing sometimes? We want the church to be healthy and holy. I had enough success in the industry, though I'm by no means a household name, and thank God, given my last name. Um, but but the, the reality is that a lot of the people involved in the, that we've sort of highlighted in our research are peers, they're friends of mine. So we're not trying to villainize an industry as though there's some secret worship cabal. That's not what's going on. My experience with the people in the industry is largely positive. Not entirely. And it's, it's comprised of people who are trying to do the best they can with the system as it is. It's true that some people profit a great deal 
from the system as it is. But that's exactly it. If we leave the system behind a curtain, then we can't ever really do anything about ensuring that it's doing what it's meant to do, biblically. My belief is that we are in a season where trust in the church is at an all-time low. More than ever, we need to be transparent, honest, and operate with integrity. If we're a Christian mechanic, we probably don't need to put Christian in front of mechanic. And so I think the same is true in the ways that we talk about business and the infrastructure of business and logistics around it. If we can't talk about it on business terms, why are we hiding? So here I am describing Oz to the best of my ability, myth-busting to the glory of God. And this is a timed out screen. This is how the worship music industrial complex works. So for the rest of my time today, I'll basically be seeking to accomplish two things. First, I'll try to outline some key findings and information about the industry. And second, I'll offer a few brief thoughts for us to chew on at the end. And I'll just warn you right now, there are not easy answers to this. But I do think that there are important questions for us to be wrestling with as we continue to do this here together. Does that make sense? All right, so let's explore the industry through the fictitious story of someone we probably all know well, though possibly by a different name. Meet Wesley. Wesley is the worship pastor at a suburban non-denominational church, though they used to be Baptist. <laughs> uh, between 350 and 500 people. Wesley loves the killers and the Avit brothers and has mixed feelings at best about CCM and Christian radio. But worship music matters to him. His faith is central to his life. And this music has shaped his experience of faith in a very profound way. Wesley loves his job, even if it's not easy. One day, his senior pastor comes in bursting with excitement about an upcoming sermon series. And so it is that our Wesley writes an absolute banger of a worship song, named after his pastor's incredibly thought-provoking series title, Baby Jesus, Big Boss Forever. By Wesley. His pastor, his church leaders, and both people who watch their live stream simply adore the song. Before long, it's discovered by the A&R at a major record label who wants to sign our dear friend Wesley. What an incredible opportunity. It's a dream come true. With the help of this team, Wesley could reach millions with the gospel, and he genuinely wants to. But he's a little nervous. After all, he's got a good life. And he loves his job. So he meets with his pastor, who encourages him to take his next step of faith and to reach people around the world with the love of Jesus. But to remember to keep his feet planted firmly on the ground. Now his pastor closes with a wink. And Stan Lee's favorite Voltaire quote. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Encouraged. Wesley takes the plunge and is soon the newest signing for both publishing and recording with Bethany Church Records. A small mega church label which is distributed and administered by Capital Christian Music Group, because they all are, <laughs> with whom they also have a co-publishing arrangement. But Wesley is about to learn that this still might be less than ideal. Why? Well, this brings us to one of our first findings with Worship Leader Research, and it's one of Wesley's first lessons. With Worship Leader Research, our first phase was to examine the industry as it has been. And our first finding, if you will, and then looking at the CCLI and praise charts together, uh, received a bit more coverage than we anticipated, because the headline was remarkably simple. 100% of the top 25 worship songs were popularized by just four megachurch movements. Now, on the one hand, that isn't that surprising. It has become clear that music revenues in all genres tend to concentrate in a very small group of contributors. That's not uncommon in business at all. This is true in almost all genres of music. It's true in most lines of business. In fact, one consultant suggested that the top 1% of artists account for somewhere around 80% of music revenue. With this in mind, we narrowed our lists when we examined CCLI and praise charts together for 10 years, 2010 to 2020, to the top 25, knowing that that probably covered 90 to 95% of what people experienced as worship music at our churches. And when we did, we found there to be a mere 38 songs. In a decade, only 38 new titles were among the top 25 songs sung in churches. Even on the surface, most of these are directly traceable to these church groups being Bethel, Hillsong, Elevation, and Passion, and as you can see, a handful of other artists. But something interesting happens when you start to look at the writing credits 
Or more importantly, how a song came to be popular in the first place and when it appeared on the charts and when it hadn't. After accounting for these collaborations, performance histories, and popularization, only six groups were responsible for the popularity of the top 25 songs in worship music, and that is because Phil Wickham had one song that was not reliant on Bethel to become well-known, and then you had North Point with Death Was Arrested. Other than that, in that 10-year window, every song was popularized or released or co-written by one of these four megachurches. I mean, this makes sense for our boy Wesley. Worship leaders and producers are exceptionally busy, often having to carry the load of multiple areas of responsibility. They're only human. It's only so many hours in a day. So if Big B Jesus, Big Boss Forever is going to work, like really work, whatever that means, he's going to need to saddle up on, on these brands that worship leaders already trust, even if they don't know it. Because the thing is, worship leaders trust brands a lot more than they think they do. Seeing just how concentrated and undeniable the influences of these four churches were, we designed part of our survey to indicate whether or not there was what is often called an intention behavior gap. This is where people intend to behave one way in a given situation, but do otherwise in said situation, usually because of specific mitigating factors. And we found that this is more or less the case. 60% of worship leaders report they are indifferent about the artists associated with a given song. They name other values that drive whether or not they're going to consider the song for a Sunday morning. But when asked about specific artists, 70% of that 60 pivot and show sometimes very powerful bias. That means the overwhelming majority of people choosing our songs are heavily influenced by brands and it is often subconscious. And that kind of explains the charts. <laughs> well, R. Wesley has signed his publishing and his record deal, and with it came a modest but meaningful advance. There's skin in the game. Now, it's time for the folks involved to help spread the word about his song, to build his career, if you will, and frankly, make some of that advance money back. It's a for-profit business, after all. But they'd better move fast, because songs have a shorter window than ever. Our research was building on the work of two of our partners, Mike Tapper and Mark, uh, sorry, Mike Tapper and Mark Jolliker. A few years back, they worked as part of a team which examined a long period of data to examine the life cycle of worship songs. And they found something that, for me, in light of what Rory was saying, in light of some neuroscience stuff I can dig into in our breakout, basically, in the last 25 years, the life cycle of popular worship songs has cut down by two-thirds. In the 90s, for example, it was typical for a popular worship song to have a shelf life of something like 11 years. That's a five-year increase, five-year rise, a six-year decline. Those of you who are around in the 90s like I was, that's very much true. Today, songs live on the charts a mere three to four years. They get there faster than ever, and they disappear before you know it. So to understand just how much this shift moved the goalposts for the industry, you need to look at how worship songwriting royalties work. And I'd love to take a minute and talk about exactly that. Now, when most people think of royalties in worship music, they're thinking about an organization called CCLI. I'm not here to villainize CCLI, though there are critics, of course. There are worship writers and publishing companies who've made millions in songwriting royalties from a single song. It's not hard to imagine how that might happen over 11 years. But some of this shift in how we all experience music has a direct relationship to this sort of thing. Because in many scenarios, a royalty for a songwriter is paid per use at the time of transaction, when you'd buy a CD or when you'd stream a song or when you'd license it for a TV show or something like that. Today, music platforms like Spotify or Apple pay a fractional cent per stream. There's a whole thing going on in the Supreme Court over publishing royalties and these streaming DSPs. Um, with CDs, legally, a per song price was paid. It's called a mechanical. Um, to the song's publisher, which would be split with the writers. I think it's somewhere around nine cents today. When my band first signed with our deal, it was 11.3 or something like that. But that's not how CCLI works at all. Instead, CCLI has all the participating churches pay a blanket licensing fee based on their size, which covers their expected usage, and it's basically priced to the size of the church. 
So that in each period, CCLI has a small selection of churches, a representative sample, which report their song set lists in that window of time. This rotates around, and this grouping functions like a sample size for the royalty statements as a whole. So one obvious aside here is that this means that songs which have a widespread, longer reach will produce more revenue than songs which are deeply loved within a smaller group, simply because of how royalties are calculated. Specificity is on the chopping block if we have to reach wide to get paid. In the United States, no royalties are paid to the master's owner and recording artist for radio, but they are paid to the copyright holder or the publisher and songwriter. And this might explain in some part why we've seen more and more worship music pushed to radio. As the shelf life of worship songs declines, CCLI payouts become shorter, publishers need to maximize their return on their investment, and radio becomes an avenue that wasn't otherwise available. Another area worth mentioning in the, gen in the music industry in general is sync which you see plenty of every day of your life. If you're unfamiliar with it, this is when music is used in film or TV. This has become, in many cases, the primary monetization strategy for general market record labels. The main way they make money, in their mind, is sync. But for worship writers, let's face it, that's not on the table in the three movies that come out that might work are going to the same four artists. It's not, it's not on the table. So for Wesley... This means that song publishing isn't quite as lucrative as it used to be, and if he wants to meet his end of his brand new shiny publishing deal, he's going to have some work to do. Like many worship leaders, Wesley signed a pub deal. No two are exactly alike, but it's fairly common to commit to a certain number of titles per year to your publisher. And what many don't realize is that the definition of a song title is fractional. For example, let's just say that you wrote a worship song with your old pal Brian, it's a 50-50 split. Well, now you submit that song to your publisher, it counts as half a title. Write it with three friends, and you've submitted a quarter of a song. Meanwhile, in the hopes of increasing their chances for success by leveraging existing church networks, publishers and writers will co-write and encourage co-writing as often as possible. Now, it can make songs better. But it also means that what looked like a reasonable number, say 10 to 12 songs a year, is now 40. Now, how many times can you say in a single year in your life you've come to 40 profound spiritual realizations? <laughs> On the bright side, this sheer volume of music helps out another major side of music monetization for Wesley's label, and that is the masters. And after months of production, they finally have a shiny new single for Wesley's big song, Baby Jesus, Big Boss Forever. It looks and goes something like this. Everyone knows on some level that streaming has changed music. But I think that many don't realize just how much it impacted worship music in particular. One key finding of our research had to do with this exact thing, and it happened in 2017 with the flick of a switch. I do not flick light switches that way. I have no idea why I did that. <laughs> Prior to 2017, new entries to the CCLI and praise charts were roughly down the middle. About half had initially intended to be served as singles for consumption, purchased as singles or listened to as singles. And this suggests that there was probably a little bit more diversity in the sort of content which might bubble up to the top. If you think about song set lists from a liturgical standpoint, this kind of makes sense. You have songs that are the big safe winners, your opener, maybe your high point. But you need songs that would never work on the radio, but help us to pray. But beginning in 2017, that number jumped to 100% and stayed there. And it was not by accident. The way we discover new songs has changed dramatically in the past six years through a concerted effort to consolidate two processes into one, distribution and discovery. By 2019, this process was so cemented that Spotify founder and CEO Daniel Ek boasted to his investors at a meeting that the growing consumption of Spotify editorial playlists, that means playlists Spotify owns, has undergone such a massive transformation that it puts Spotify in control of the demand curve. 
Since then, user playlists have been replaced by editorial playlists in search, and increasingly, algorithmic playlists too. So Wesley's a &R looks him in the eye and says what my promoter said to me just a few years ago. Look, from what we can see, if a new worship song doesn't make New Music Friday Christian, financially, it's dead in the water. Well, it's because worship leaders tend to trust playlists. And that's an important one to point out. It, it, new Music Friday Christian showcases new music all the time. That's what it does. And this is because of something called the cold start problem in software. Software systems rely on data, right? Your algorithm, when you start a new Instagram account, you got to say certain things. Threads is making everybody announce their interests. Like, that's not weird. They're solving the cold start problem. So for Spotify to function the way it likes to, they have to have a minimum threshold of data that's needed to properly ascertain how to recommend your song. For this same reason, Spotify have previously recommended artists release a new song of some kind every three to six weeks. Thus, the argument goes, you have to keep your audience on their toes and fuel the algorithm with much needed data. And New Music Friday Christian is one way to get that data. But Wesley and his, and his a &R team now face a different problem. New Music Friday has 100 playlist spots. And they're not all dedicated to brand new music every week. And in the Christian gospel channels alone, that's all Christian music of every kind for the most part, uh, editors for Spotify and Apple report getting upwards of 1,000 songs per week. For every slot on those coveted playlists, there are 10 or more that won't make the cut. So what's a label to do? Well, the good news is, for Wesley, that labels and distributors have direct access. So what platforms in, like TuneCore don't tell you is that while it appears democratic, they don't actually solve the cold start problem for you in any meaningful way. And the reason is that these new music playlists are programmed by a very small group of people. At Spotify, it's three. At Apple, it's two for the entire world. Knowing this, the labels stay in regular communication with these editors, often supplying a ranked choice spreadsheet of their own releases for a given week to maximize communication and priority. Without that access, if you're not on that spreadsheet, it's a shot in the dark at the best. For me, after my deal finished, that meant getting a, getting a label services deal with the label I'd previously worked with and releasing my releases on the day that they don't have one. And that worked. But it's tough out there. But, says Wesley's a &R, there's always radio. In many cases, radio and live events are the only remaining strategies for the eager record label. A patchwork of label and contracted radio promoters can make canvassing the entire country's radio stations a realistic project, but it's just a question of cost. But what they didn't know is that radio is an indirect promotions tool for people like Wesley, and probably for many of you. In our survey of worship leaders, Christian radio was among the strongest negative responses. In other words, if you first hear a song on Christian radio, you think you're less likely to add it. Which means that you are prioritizing the channels you already follow day by day, which means you are prioritizing the people who are currently winning. One way or another. Fortunately for Wesley and his a &R, that doesn't matter as much as we think. Historically, Christian music radio uh, targets a specific kind of listener named Becky, predominantly female, once upon a time in her 30s, now in her 40s. She is aging. That's not good for a business. Uh, probably a couple of kids in tow, and she's looking for a safe alternative to the top 40. I think many of you will agree that this happens to correlate to a very involved volunteer group in churches. 40-something women with two kids are often very involved. That's a good thing. This group often has the ear of their pastor. So as much as worship leaders may not like Christian radio themselves, they listen to all of the people that do. Radio is not nearly as monolithic in the church as is often thought. If you've ever tried to teach a song that you knew came from Caleb, only to get blinky eyes the entire time, you know what this is like. And it's pretty simple math, too. If you contrast... Pew's weekly attendance data with Christian national radio airplay audiences, you'll see roughly four out of five regular churchgoers listens to practically no Christian radio at all. Four out of five. Your local church and you might be the only place many people hear and discover new Christian songs. At least at the beginning. That's it, says Wesley. 
We can help other worship leaders fall in love with this new song the same way my church did, hearing it live in the room. No? Okay. Um, and he's right. Worship leaders rate live experiences as one of the most prominent ways that a new song can sink in, significantly increasing the likelihood that they'd consider teaching it at their church. And while this by no means is the case across the board, it can also be difficult to separate that from commercial interests too, even if you wanted to. These are expensive to run. For example, worship together is one of the biggest of these sorts of conferences. It's very song-centric. It's a resource, right? Worship Together is a brand and website owned and maintained by Capital Christian Music Group, which is owned by UMG. Unsurprisingly, the Worship Together lineup often favors them within their catalog. Before you think I'm villainizing them, my songs are at Worship Together. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just thinking it's best we be honest. I'm not cynical. But what Wesley was only now coming to learn was that incredibly formative and commercial power had already been in his hands as a guy picking songs at the local church and he'd never known. With great power comes great responsibility, his pastor had said. If only Wesley had known how much he already had. To land the plane, I have to report that thankfully for the rest of us, Wesley prayerfully went home a local hero spent years doing his life of faith with the people he loved, a long walk in the, I, I'm screwing up a Eugene Peterson quote, I should leave. <laughs> and the rest of us were spared from the glory that was baby Jesus, big boss, forever. So I don't have easy answers to this. Not long after this research started to come out, I found myself on the phone with a few friends, guys like David Leonard, Phil Wickham, Phil and Brandon Lake's manager. Um, this isn't, that unusual, but the suspicion was real. I had questions to answer. I've been an artist for years. I know these guys. People were curious why we were talking about this. What are we after? But here's the thing. This isn't a gotcha. That's not the point. There's no cabal of evil worship leaders. It has always been difficult to separate the distribution and use of music and art from the technologies and systems which make it possible. Even with hymns, while they certainly didn't make nearly the money that is made today, that's true of all music. It was actually a decent vertical to be in. Some companies teeter on the edge of bankruptcy because of how bad it was to sell paper music. But it was primarily a for-profit business interest that drove the spread of hymnals. We live and operate in a system. What's scary, based on what Rory was saying, is a quote by W. Edwards Deming, which says, every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. If we believe in what we're doing, if we believe in this thing, then it matters a great deal what we're putting in to the system and how, and how we view our role in it. I'm gonna, quote, I'm gonna close with a Brian Dirksen quote that I think captures it really, really well. Instead of a healthy pace of change, our disposable song culture is in danger of becoming deformative. We need to choose our songs with thoughtfulness and care because the songs we sing repeatedly will either form us or deform us. When the songs tell the story of love, service, and wonder, they form us into good and beautiful humans who care for the earth, love God, neighbor, and self. If our song selection censors out honesty and the sound of lament and only declares the story of power, strength, and greatness, even the greatness of God, these songs become unbalanced and deformative, priming us for a characterless Christianity. Pace of change and content matter because both are formative. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Eli.